Okay, good morning. Nice to see you all this morning. Let's stand together. This robes for mine, a wonderful exchange. Think about what Christ did for you by putting his robe of righteousness on you, paying the price for your sins. Let's sing it together. the next verse. The gentleman will join us at the chorus. Here we go, ladies. His robes for my oh, justice is a to be thinking 2 Corinthians 5.21 when you sing that song, for he, God, hath made him, Jesus, to be sin for us, who knew no sin, that's Jesus, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. When you read in the New Testament that word for, Christ died for our sins according to the scripture, there are various Greek words behind that some of them with great emphasis, some of them less, but all meaning this, that he was a substitute. He took our place. He didn't just die as an example, as some would say, for our sins, but no, it was a substitutionary atonement. No question about that. Anything less is heresy. So Jesus took our sins upon himself, and he gave us his righteousness for as many as are baptized into Christ, spiritual baptism, have put on Christ. In, in uh, Romans chapter 4, when it talks about Abraham, it says that Abraham believed God and it was 
counted unto him for righteousness. Later on it says it wasn't written about Abraham alone. You know, it was about us as well who have believed on him who raised up Jesus from the dead. And we have his imputed righteousness. Righteousness put to our account. Don't leave off half the gospel. You know, Christ took away my sins. Great, he did. What's the rest of it? His robes for mine. I live in his righteousness and I walk in newness of life because of what he has done for me. Let's pray. Father, thank you again for your amazing, wonderful grace that would look upon sinners that call out in the name of Jesus and not only forgive us, Lord, but give us your righteousness. We thank you, Lord, that we stand perfect and complete in Christ. That's our position. And we know nothing can change that. We're in Christ. And one of these days we'll be caught up with him and with our departed saints if we should live. And then, Lord, we will be with you to see your face. Thank you for that. Thank you that we'll be able to enter into glory because sin has been taken away and righteousness has been imputed. I pray today for Dr. Davis. Enable him, I pray. Help him to, to communicate very clearly today. And may we receive what you would have for us. Well, thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. you may be seated. Just a couple of announcements. Uh, small groups will start on Wednesday. Check your email. Uh, the assignments are coming out today. Uh, that's the plan. You should have those today. If you don't get an assignment by the end of the day, uh, start asking others if they got theirs. And if they did, you got missed somehow. And so we want to make sure that you get your proper uh, assignment. And then Grayson Adams from Bryan, Texas. Are you with us in this chapel? If you are, would you just let us know by raising your hand and somebody help me? I see a hand back there. Let's give him a hand for being here. All right. Thank you for coming. All right. God bless you. I pray for a great week today. And let's uh, pray we have some good weather this afternoon. All right. Yeah. Amen. I went to public school. We were made to memorize this hymn, third grade or fourth grade. We had to write out all the verses by memory. Pretty sure you couldn't get away with that today. But it's been a favorite of mine ever since. Would you stand once again? When I survey the wondrous cross. We're the whole realm of nature mine. Rebecca Bosey is going to come play for us now, a beautiful medley. I'd rather have Jesus and an old spiritual in the morning when I rise. Give me Jesus.
Amen. What a blessing. I don't know if it's just the uh, condensation that comes up into my eyes because I wear a mask, but I feel like I'm just so much more emotional these days. <laughs> Can I remind you of something this morning? You've made it one week through the semester, so good job. Uh, we have all survived <laughs> All right, week one. Remember, I told you the first two weeks are really critical 
to helping establish a good, healthy environment on campus, and I believe you've done a good job with that so far. Please continue to discipline yourselves and uh, exercise good uh, habits, good, good practices along the lines of what all the health professionals are telling us, but ultimately we do understand that our protection comes from the Lord and that the Lord allows the things into our lives. And today I'm going to take a moment to talk us through or think through this uh, common phrase, God won't give you more than you can handle. How many of you have heard that before? All right, how many of you probably used that before? I know I have. But I'm going to challenge us a little bit today that maybe this is one of those Christian cliches that we use to get ourselves out of an uncomfortable conversation, perhaps. Somebody's opening up to you about their situation or about some problem that they have, and you have no idea what to say. So you go grabbing for one of these Christian cliches, uh, what I call unquestioned answer, something really at the surface level where maybe what we really need to do is dig in and find out what God's Word has to say. Now, I remind you one other thing. Every time I have the opportunity to speak in chapel, I'd just like to take a minute and say to you, I love you. You are the reason we're here. And uh, we, we are very much uh, appreciative, thankful to God uh, for you. You are a blessing. And it has been a huge blessing having you back on campus. Amen, faculty. Amen, Mrs. M. All right. <laughs> and even though we can't see all of you all the time, we are very thankful for you. And we love you. And we want to see you succeed. And we want your best. Every single person that works for Maranatha is dedicated to your success. Did you realize that? Every single one of us wants to see you succeed for the Lord in life. And uh, never, ever, ever get the idea that somehow we're against you or out to get you. Couldn't be further from the truth. We want to help you, and our doors are always open to you. So I just want to take that moment and acknowledge that and remind you of that today. Have you ever heard something like this? I know you're going through a tough time right now. Maybe you say, yes, I am going through a tough time right now. You got that right. You feel like you're sinking. The burden is too heavy you don't know how much more you can bear, but it's going to be all right. You're going to make it through. Remember, God won't give you more than you can handle. I'm sure we've all heard this, thought this, probably said this to someone going through a difficult time, a rough patch. And we mean well, but we need to examine this a little more carefully, search for the Bible truth behind the half-truth, and see if we can come up with even a better option to use in the future. This is one of those Christian cliches, something that people say when they just don't really know what to say. And honestly, it does have some scriptural basis. Turn your Bible to 1 Corinthians chapter 10 today. 1 Corinthians chapter 10. You know this verse by heart, most likely. 1 Corinthians 10, verse 13. There hath no temptation taken you, but such as is common to man. But God is faithful, who will not suffer you to be tempted above that ye are able, but will, with the temptation, also make a way to escape, that ye may be able to bear it. But is God won't give you anything you can't handle really what this verse is all about? Well, let's examine the verse a little more closely. Yes, the word here that's translated tempted can be translated as tested. There are some places in Scripture where that's what the word is generally meant, meant to imply. But the context of this passage makes it very clear that this is not about God testing us with trials of life, but that it truly is about temptation to sin. And the Bible is very clear that God does not ever test us with temptation to sin. James 1.13 says that. Let no man say when he is tempted that God is the one that did that. God can't be tempted with sin, neither tempteth he any man. The truth is we do that all on our own. Think about James 1.13. Think about other passages of Scripture that make it clear that God is not the source of our temptations to sin. Let's look at this chapter, 1 Corinthians 10, chapter 10. Look at verse number 5. But with many of them, God was not well pleased, but they were overthrown in the wilderness. Who's he talking about? Well, 1 Corinthians chapter 10, the Apostle Paul is talking to these uh, Corinthian believers and others in that area, obviously. 
And he begins to recount for them their own history, the history of the Jewish people wandering in the wilderness. And he's using them as an example for what was then, of course, in Paul's day, the modern believer, the Christian. And he says, let's look back at our history and let's see what, how God works and let's see how we work. And he says, but with many of them, God was not well pleased for they were overthrown in the wilderness. Overthrown how? Well, they were overthrown with, with sin. And in, in verse 5, particularly, the sin is the sin of rebellion. Then in verse number 6, now these things were our examples. He makes it very explicit. I'm giving you this history because it's relevant for today. The reason we study history in a liberal arts education is so that you will understand the context in which humanity has always existed and the lessons that we can learn from that. And so here Paul is telling modern believers in Corinth, they're not so modern to us, right? But they are modern believers to him. He says, listen, this ancient history that you learned in Sunday school, or maybe it was at that time Saturday school, right? Now it's Wednesday night we're doing Sunday school at Calvary and I'm all mixed up, right? But we have, uh, we have these old lessons that we've learned from history, but can they apply to us today? He says, these things were for an example to the intent that we should not lust after evil things as they also lusted, the envy, the worldliness that they were living in. Verse 7, he talks and warns them about the temptation for the sin of idolatry and idleness. He says, neither be ye idolaters as were some of them, as it is written, the people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play, honestly with no thought about God or what God wanted them to do. He goes on to warn them about sexual immorality in verse number 8. Neither let us commit fornication as some of them committed and fell in one day three and twenty thousand. Verses 9 and 10, he talks to them about the sin of unbelief and complaining. By the way, those go hand in hand. Neither let us tempt Christ as some of them also tempted and were destroyed of serpents. Neither murmur ye as some of them also murmured and were destroyed of the destroyer. You say, what does the word murmur mean? I don't use that word very often. Well, murmur is a great word because it means what it sounds like. You say, what do you mean? Well, if you've ever murmured, murmur, 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 oh, no, why? After syllabus day, I can't, I'm never going to get all this stuff done. That's murmuring, right? That's complaining. That's faithless way to live. And Paul warns them about this sin of complaining and unbelief. Verse number 12, he warns them again about the sin of pride. Wherefore, let him that thinketh he standeth take heed lest he fall. And so is there any doubt that by the time he gets to verse 13, when he says, there is no temptation taken you, but such as is common to man, is there any doubt whatsoever that he's talking about the temptation to sin? That's plainly the context of this passage. And so who is he talking to? Well, he's talking to new converts in a wicked city surrounded by old temptations. You see, in 1 Corinthians chapter 6 and verse 11, he recounts many of the wicked sins that would, would have been very common in Corinth in that day. And then he uses an interesting phrase. He says, and such were some of you. You know, the temptations that we used to be involved with are some of the strongest things that want to pull us back, even after God has changed us and given us a new heart. And yet the flesh is still a constant battle. You know, everyone has a different temptation. I've never been tempted to smoke cigarettes. Oh, I could stand up here with great pride and tell you I've never smoked a cigarette in my entire life. Well, zippity doo da. okay. <laughs> there are a lot of other things, wicked things that I've done in my life that I'm ashamed of. And yet, I'm, uh, do I get proud about the one thing that I, I'm not tempted for? I, I take that, there was only one time in my life that I ever even thought, that smoking a cigarette was a, even looked cool or even, even was, was, uh, had an, a single advantage. Like, it's always just been gross to me, right? I mean, I, I grew up, you used to be able to smoke cigarettes on the airplane with other people. But don't worry, there was a smoking section. As if, right? I mean, like, we're in a, t a locked tube at 30,000 feet in the air with the same air circulating around, but they're in the smoking section, so it's okay, right? Okay, whatever. I remember all those days, and it was gross. But you know, I was taking the bar exam, 
And I came out on one of the breaks, and this guy next to me had been huffing and puffing the entire time, murmuring probably, you know. And he was, oh, oh, he was really having an anxiety attack over there. And he was going on and on, and we got out. And it would have been tough, believe me. And we get out at lunchtime, and I, he, he burst out the doors as soon as they let us re- go out. And I didn't have any idea where he went. I figured, man, he's got to go bad, you know, or something. I don't know. Well, I walk out the doors outside, and here's this guy sitting by the fountain. And I mean, I never saw a transformation so dramatic. Here's this guy smoking this cigarette. And I thought, how sad, you know, but wow, okay, I get it. That's why he's doing that. But you know, other than that one time, I've never in in my life. And yet, there are many temptations that are unique to me that wouldn't even phase you, that you'd think was ridiculous. The the point isn't that none of us are ever tempted or that all of us are tempted with everything. The point is that each and every one of us is tempted to sin. And for these Corinthians, the temptations were there and they were old temptations. Corinth was an exceedingly wicked city, even by the standards of that time. It was well known, even by secular standards, as a wicked place. And can you imagine trying to be a good, godly, living for Christ, Christian witness in that city at that time. You know, I don't think it was terribly different than living in the United States today. You realize it's not popular to live for the Lord. It's not popular to even live your life by a set of standards that would set you apart in a way that would call attention to the fact that you are different. And yet that's exactly where these Corinthians found themselves. And so this encouragement that Paul gives them in 1 Corinthians 10, 13 is in order to help them through this particular circumstance that, by the way, is the same for you and I. He says, there's no temptation taking you, but such as is common to man. He says, our experience of being tempted is not unique. Everyone is. He says, though, that God is faithful who will not suffer you. In other words, this verse isn't about God declining to give you more than you can handle. It's about God helping you when you are tempted to sin. And so ultimately, he says that he will provide a way to escape. Temptation comes our way inevitably. And we understand that to be tempted is not to sin. It's not a sin to be tempted. That's something that's going to happen. It even happened to the Lord Jesus Christ during his earthly ministry. And so being tempted is not a sin. What, where we cross that line is when we begin to entertain that temptation and when we give into it. And yet the Bible tells us that there is a way to escape. God isn't the cause of our testing, He is the solution to the temptations that we have. And so, when I am tempted, there is always a way out. Now, you may have convinced yourself that that's not true. You may have convinced yourself that there is some sin in your life that is so overwhelming and has has you so in its grip that there isn't any way for you not to do it. And that's not true. On the authority of Scripture, on the authority of this single verse, You can claim the promise of God that there is a way out. There is an escape path. He is offering you the way out. The problem is, I may not be looking very hard for the exit. And the truth is, there are times when we decide that we love our sin more than we love the Savior who died for it. And as Dr. Marriott said today, this was a substitutionary atonement and I am supposed to be living in the reality of my spiritual reality. And there is always a way of escape. And so the point of 1 Corinthians 10, 13 is that my temptations to sin are never so strong that I cannot resist in the power of the Holy Spirit. The devil can never make you do it. You've probably heard that Christian cliche before too. Well, the devil made me do it. Can't be done. The devil can't make you do it. The flip side of that is, unfortunately, (laughs) when I sin, I have no excuse and no one to blame but me. So where does this Christian cliche miss the mark? 
Maybe 1 Corinthians 10, 13 isn't the perfect proof text for this phrase, but does that mean the phrase isn't true? Well, let's look at some ways that this phrase could actually do more harm than good. How about this thought? Plenty of things in life are more than we can handle. God won't give you more than you can handle. Excuse me? I got a lot of things in my life that I can't handle, that are way more than I can handle, at least alone. And those are the times that we need to turn to others, not just to be encouraged that, hey, don't worry, you can do it. No, this is a time for you to reach out for help. And that's not a bad thing. We don't want to drive hurting people away from the help that they need because they feel ashamed, because they are overwhelmed and feel that they can't handle it. Man, they said God wouldn't give me anything more than I can handle, but I feel like I can't handle this, but man, they've got their act together, but I'm falling apart over here. That person won't reach out. And yet God designed Christians for the need for community, for the need for each other. That's why all those one another passages are there. That's why God designed the local church. That's what it's for, for us to bear one another's burdens. Why would I need to do that if you were able to handle all your burdens on your own? The truth is that the first part of the phrase, God won't give you, pretty much implies that God is intentionally causing the pain and difficulties in our lives. Really? Well, we better think twice before suggesting such a thing. What kind of God tests his children by having their spouses beat them, their siblings commit suicide, their friends suffer with cancer, all the horrible things that happen due to sin in this world? That's not God God causing those things. The pain and the immense suffering in this world is not caused by God. It is the effect of sin. It is not the world that God designed. This is a a, a byproduct of the sin in this world. It's almost like we're saying, listen, uh, God gave you this horrible, painful, hurting thing, but he'll stop giving you more suffering right before you reach the breaking point. So don't worry. Well, how comforting. (laughs) Consider in the world immense tragedy, war-torn failed states, drought-ravaged nations, starving refugees. We don't say to them, hey, God won't give you more than you can handle. (laughs) We say, how can we help? Notice the difference? It's a pretty big difference. Christians need to be part of the solution, not just tossing in cliches and then going on our way. The second part of the phrase, God won't give you more than you can handle, also has some problems. So whether it's physical, emotional, spiritual, psychological, financial, pretty much every single one of us absolutely will face things that are way more than we can handle. Have a nice day. (laughs) What? Dr. Davis, I thought if I went to Maranatha and got a degree, I'd be able to avoid all those things. Sorry. You know, we, we cry with our alumni when they face tragedy. One of my good friends that I sat next to in chapel here died this summer saving the lives of his two teenage kids. He drowned. I can't imagine the suffering of that family. But it's not about me saying, well, you know, you got to try to handle it. No. The emphasis is wrong. It's like God is pouring on the weight, and I have to lift it all on my own until I reach my breaking point, and then he'll stop. I'm sorry, but life is not about what I can handle. The promise of Scripture is not that we will not go through hard times. What Scripture does promise is that at all times, good or bad, God wants to be our help and our strength. And He will be, and here's the key promise, present. 
He is here. He is with you. That's the difference. It's not about the nature of the circumstance. It's about the presence of God in my life and in my circumstance. God didn't give us all these hardships, but I trust that God walks with me through them. And that the Lord Jesus Christ has already walked through and shared our human experiences with us. Hebrews 4.15, For we have not an high priest which cannot be touched with the feelings of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. 1 Peter 5.7, Casting all your care upon him, for he careth for you. So if... God won't give you more than you can handle is a a half-truth or a Christian cliche that we shouldn't use because basically it's a half-truth that's all wrong in its emphasis and its conclusions. Is there a better way to encourage people going through hard and painful circumstances? Well, rather than God won't give you more than you can handle, how about God will help you handle all that you've been given? At first, this may not seem very different, but the theological difference is significant. Number one, it does not suggest that God gave you all the suffering in your life, and he loaded all these burdens on you just short of your breaking point. Secondly, it acknowledges that adversity will happen in life, but for many causes. By the way, One of the greatest reasons why we have a lot of the adversity in our lives is us. (laughs) We invite it in through poor choices, through ignoring the wisdom of Scripture and the leading of the Holy Spirit and the wise counsel that God has assembled around us. And so we shed all those things and then we end up in hard circumstances and blame God. What? Thirdly, it promises that God walks with you through it all. Can you think of some Bible promises that match that sentiment? that God is with me throughout the hard times of life? Well, how about the one you learned probably earliest on in life in Psalm 23, verse 4? Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. Why? For thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. We don't expect God to keep the dark valleys from happening, nor do we blame them, him for causing them, but we take comfort in knowing that he, we will not be alone. He is with us. Psalm 46, verse 1, God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in, time, in, in trouble. Present in the sense of he's with us in the present, but present also in the sense that he is with us right? He is here. Therefore, will not we fear, though the earth be removed, (laughs) and though the mountains be carried into the midst of the sea? I have to be honest. Those circumstances sound a lot like things I couldn't handle. (laughs) On what basis would I not be afraid during a calamity like the earth being removed, right? The only way that I could not be afraid, as the verse says, is because God's presence is my refuge and my strength. I'm not handling these circumstances at all. God is. And how about Romans 8? I've been in Romans 8 since like March when all this stuff started happening. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or peril, or sword. I mean, he lists out a lot of things, some of which we've seen in the last four months. As it is written, for thy sake we are killed all the day long. Another thing I can't handle. We are accounted as sheep for the slaughter. Nay, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Oh, look, 
more stuff I can't handle on my own. How can I be a conqueror? How can I be more than a conqueror? Because nothing can separate me from the love of Christ, not even death. So, in the application of this better promise, number one, it's okay to reach out for help. Some of you need help. You do. I know you do. Because every semester, there are students that need help. Maybe it's academic help. Please don't wait till week three, or week eight, or week 15, or week 17 when you appeal the grade after the fact. Get help now. There are so many people on this campus that are here just to help you. They get paid to do it. <laughs> it's part of their job. It's part of their life's commitment. And even way beyond what they get paid to do, because they love you like I do, they want to help you. It's okay to reach out for help. It's okay to be transparent. It's okay to be broken on the inside. Maybe the outside too. It's okay. Sometimes we drive students away or we drive loved ones away or we drive the people around us away with the idea that they can't be a mess <laughs> as much as they feel like maybe they are on the inside. You don't have to open up to everyone. I'm not suggesting that every day on your story you have to blabber on and on about all your life's problems. There are people that do that too, right? <laughs> I'm not suggesting that. But to open up to someone. Let someone help you. And by the way, if you're the someone that they open up to, this is a privileged and very heavy responsibility, isn't it? But God's going to help you with that as well. Remember, the purpose of Christian community, the purpose of church, <laughs> is to bear each other's burdens. Because you are not alone. God is always with you. The feeling of loneliness is one of the most powerful human emotions, especially when we are overwhelmed with burdens. We get it in our head that we are the only ones. But it's not true. God is with us, and he is for us. The other application, of course, is that your suffering, which is real, has purpose. You know, every college class, every college student thinks that they're the one going through the worst, most difficult, you know, college experience ever, right? My class thought it. Dr. Marriott's class probably thought it. But you know what the truth is? You might actually be right <laughs> if you think that. You are. You are going through unprecedented hardships, uncertainties, doubts. Your future is very uncertain. I get it. That's, that could produce some anxiety, right? Some feelings. I get it. But your suffering has purpose. When we suffer as a Christian, others take note and others are encouraged. When others have the privilege of helping you lift your burden, it brings them encouragement and fulfillment and purpose to be a caregiver. Do you realize that some of the professions in this world that are, that are labeled as some of the most fulfilling the most uh, 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 wonderful uh, professions to get into because you feel like your life matters and you've done something uh, really special are the professions like nursing, being a doctor, being a firefighter, being a police officer, being somebody whose job it is to rush into a calamity, a situation where people are having burdens that they can't lift, right? Right? And yet, we oftentimes, we use the phrase, well, I don't want to be a burden. You ever try to reconcile those two things? Kind of interesting that we would hold up this profession or this activity as being so meaningful and so fulfilling, and yet we want to act like, well, I don't want to be a burden on others by opening up. Ultimately, though, your suffering's purpose is to bring glory to God. Your testimony in life glorifies God. God is glorified when you praise Him in faith. God is glorified when He prevails through your trials, when the impossible is accomplished. And so it's not so much that God is pouring on the burdens and will stop just at the breaking point, but it's that God is present with us through our trials, through the persecutions in life, 
through the difficulties that will come. And he promises that he will never leave us. He will never forsake us. He is always there and for us. And so what's the better phrase? God will help you handle all that you've been given. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, your love for us is difficult for us to comprehend, impossible maybe, certainly on this earth. And yet, Lord, you are with us, you are for us, and through your power, through the Holy Spirit in our lives, we can be more than conquerors, that the old temptations of our flesh do not have to have a grip, a power on us, that we will have a way of escape. Help us to to be looking for it and to claim it and to find it and to access it. And then beyond that, Lord, we know that there are things in life that are more than we can handle. Thank you for friends around us. Thank you for loved ones. Thank you for wise counselors that are available to us to help us to think biblically and to support us in wise and good choices. Help us to listen to those voices. And certainly your word, Lord, which instructs us in all manner of ways in which we ought to live in this wicked world around us. And Lord, ultimately, we we are most thankful for your presence with us in every difficulty and every uncertainty and every challenge of life. Lord, we love these students and we want them to succeed and we want them to be uh, a shining testimony to you in a way that glorifies you, that they should live to the praise of your glory in Jesus' name. Amen. Have a wonderful day. Mm